This is a modern record player designed to control music on Spotify, combining the physical experience of vinyl with digital playback. It spins records that represent songs, albums, or playlists using RFID technology to detect which record has been placed on the player. It's all powered by a Raspberry Pi and it even has a functional tone arm that starts and stops playback. The idea for this project came a few years ago when I received these vinyl record coasters as a gift. Even though they looked cool, they weren't very functional as coasters and kept leaving condensation behind, so I decided to turn them into something more. In this video, I'll walk you through how I built this DIY modern record player, from the electronics and 3D printed parts to the software that brings it all together. The main component behind this project is the vinyl record coasters. You can find these on Amazon for around $10 and they come as a set of 6 mini records along with a record player style stand. The stand also has a tone arm which is mounted underneath with a screw. To power everything, I'm using a Raspberry Pi Zero 2W which is a small, inexpensive and power efficient option. I'd recommend getting the version with pre-soldered headers in order to avoid having to do any soldering. Along with the Pi, we'll also need a micro SD card and a power supply cable. Next up is the RC522 RFID reader module. This is what allows a record player to detect which record is placed on the turntable. To go along with the RFID reader, I'm using these NFC sticker tags, which get attached to the records in order to identify them. To make the record spin, I'm using the 28BYJ48 5V stepper motor, which is a cheap and widely available motor that comes with a standard connector. Paired with a stepper motor is a ULM2003 driver board. The driver board makes it easy to control the motor directly from the Pi's GPIO pins, and the stepper motor gives us precise control over rotation. To detect the torn arm position, I'm using an A3144 Hall effect sensor, which acts as a magnetic switch when it detects a magnetic field. We'll also need a 2mm magnet, which is attached to the tone arm to trigger the sensor. And finally, to put everything together, we'll need a handful of female to female jumper wires to connect all the components, along with some M2 and M3 screws to mount everything securely. You can find links to all the components down in the description or in the GitHub repo. With all the components ready, we can build a quick prototype using a breadboard and a Raspberry Pi GPIO extension board to test our circuit and components. First up is the RFID reader module. I'll begin by connecting all the jumper wires to the reader's pins. Then I'll connect the reader's power input to 3.3 volts on the Pi and ground to ground, followed by the remaining signal pins as shown in the schematic here. Now we can power on the Pi and run a simple test script. When I scan one of the RFID stickers, the tag's ID gets printed in the terminal. I can also scan the entire pack to see that each tag has a unique ID. Next up is the stepper motor. We can start by directly connecting the motor connector to the driver board. For power, I'm wiring the driver's positive input to the Pi's 5V pin and ground to ground. Then the control pins IN1 through IN4 are connected to GPIO pins on the Pi, following the diagram here. Once powered on, we can run a test and see the stepper motor start to spin. The four LEDs on the driver board light up as each coil is energized in sequence, showing the stepping phases in action. As a side note, it's usually not recommended to power motors directly from the Raspberry Pi's 5V pin. Here, I'm only running a single stepper motor which draws around 250 milliamps, so I haven't had any issues. And finally, we'll connect the Hall effect sensor. This one is simple, power goes to 3.3 volts, ground to ground, and the output pin connects to GPIO 25. We can test it by bringing a magnet close to the sensor and watching the LED light up. One important detail is that this sensor is unipolar, meaning it only triggers when the south pole of the magnet is facing the sensor. We'll need to keep that in mind when positioning magnets in the final design. Using this setup, we can also have the stepper motor rotate when the magnet is detected, which is how the turntable will eventually be controlled using the tone arm. And that's all the core components wired up and tested. 
For reference, here's a complete circuit diagram for the electronics. With the prototype working, the next step is designing a case to house everything. For the case, I started by measuring different parts of the coaster stand with my digital caliper to design a 3D model. From there, I designed the enclosure and added an internal ledge on the top so the coaster stand rests on it and stays in place without needing any screws. Before designing the rest of the enclosure, I sent it off to my Elegoo Centauri Carbon to print the case and do a test fit. After I was happy with the fits, I went back into the design and added mounting features for all the internal components, including screw bosses and threaded holes for the electronics. I also designed a small magnet holder that replaces a screw on the tone arm, along with a platter that sits on the stepper motor shaft to spin the records. And after going through a couple of iterations, here are the final printed parts. On the front of the case, I added a speaker grill to give it a more realistic record player look. Inside, you can see the mounting bosses that hold everything in place, and on the back, there's an opening for the power cable along with a few ventilation cutouts for airflow. The platter has a small hole on top for the spindle and a bottom hole that fits onto the stepper motor shaft. And finally, the magnet holder includes a slot for the magnets and a threaded insert to replace the screw. With the enclosure and parts finalized, the next step is assembling the full build. Now it's time to put everything together. First, we'll make a few modifications to the coaster stand. I'm starting by removing the screw from the tone arm. After that, I'm using pliers to remove the spindle from the center. There's probably an easier way to do this, but I started by cutting off the bottom plastic, then carefully applying pressure to push the spindle out. Next, it's time to prepare the hole for the platter. I'm using a drill bit to create a hole in the center, starting with a smaller bit and gradually moving to a larger one until the hole is roughly 9mm in diameter. This is where the platter will sit on top of the stepper motor shafts. Now let's move on to the enclosure. I'll start by placing the Raspberry Pi in the top left corner, where the built-in pins align with the Pi's mounting holes to hold it in place. From there, the stepper motor drops into the center slot and gets secured with two M3 screws. In the bottom right corner, the motor driver mounts using four M3 screws. Next, I'll prepare the Hall effect sensor by bending the sensor leads at the end so it forms a 90 degree angle. This allows the sensor face to line up properly with the magnet on the tone arm. Once it's positioned correctly, I secure the board in place using two M2 screws. After that, the RFID reader mounts on the left side using two M2 screws as well. With all the electronics installed, I'll insert a magnet into the magnet holder and carefully thread it into the tone arm. Here, I'm making sure the tone arm is lined up with the magnet so it activates the sensor when positioned on the record. At this point, the coaster stand can be placed on top of the enclosure. Then, I take the platter, insert the spindle into the center hole, and slide it onto the stepper motor shaft. And with that, the enclosure is fully assembled. Next, I'll move on to preparing the records. I start by placing an NFC sticker on the back of each record aligning the position so it passes over the RFID reader when the record spins. To make the records feel more authentic, I printed custom center labels for the Spotify media that I'll be assigning to each record. I cut the label, glue it onto the record, poke a hole in the middle, and this is how it turns out. The same process can be repeated for the rest of the records. If you'd like to expand your collection, you can also 3D print additional records using the included 3MF files. 
You can also print sleeves to store the records, making them easier to organize and showcase. I also designed a record stand to display them and show what's currently playing. Next up, we'll walk through the software installation and setup so we can start controlling music. Now let's move on to the software setup. We'll start by flashing the Raspberry Pi OS onto the micro SD card. For this, I'm using the Raspberry Pi Imager, which you can download from the Raspberry Pi websites. I'll fast forward through this section since there are plenty of tutorials online covering the flashing process. In short, you'll select your device and operating system, set a host name, configure your Wi-Fi credentials, and create a username and password so you can SSH into the Pi. Once the flashing is complete, insert the micro SD card into the Pi and power it on. Then open a terminal window and SSH into the Pi using the hostname and credentials you just configured. Here I'll be cloning the GitHub repository, which you can find a link for in the description. Next I'll navigate into the project directory and run the install scripts. This installs all the required dependencies and sets up a Python virtual environment. Once the installation finishes, you'll be prompted to reboot the Pi, which we'll go ahead and accept. Before we continue, we need to set up a Spotify app so the project can control playback using the API. I'll head over to the Spotify for Developers website and log in with my Spotify accounts. In the dashboard, we can create an app, give it a name and description, and enter the redirect URI shown here. Then I'll select the Web API option and create the app. In the terminal, I'll SSH back into the Pi. This time, I'll activate the Python virtual environments and run the setup scripts. Here, I'll choose the option to configure Spotify credentials and paste in the client ID, client secret, and redirect URI from the Spotify app. The script will then output a URL that needs to be opened in a browser. Here, I'll copy the redirected URL and paste it back in the terminal. And with that, the Spotify credentials are set up. Next, we'll assign Spotify media to each record. I'll choose option 2 to write RFID tags. The script will prompt me to scan a tag, so I'll place a record over the RFID reader. Back in the terminal, it will then ask for a Spotify URI. To find this, open the song, album, or playlist in your browser, click the three dots, select share, then hold Alt on Windows or Option on Mac and click Copy Spotify URI. I'll paste that URI into the terminal and the record is now linked to that track or playlist. You can repeat this process for all of your records and once you're done, exit the script. And that's it for the software setup. At this point, we can run the record player scripts and start controlling music. Here is the final build in action. When the tone arm moves into position, the stepper motor begins spinning the records. As soon as the RFID reader detects a new tag, it calls the Spotify API to play the corresponding track. It also keeps track of the current playback position, so if you stop and start the same track, it automatically resumes where it left off. As a side note, the record player controls playback on your active Spotify device, whether it's a speaker, phone, or computer. Overall, this was a really fun project to build and it was my first time combining electronics with custom 3D design. If there's enough interest, there's plenty of room to expand this further, from adding a rotary encoder for volume control to designing a custom PCB with an ESP32, or even integrating speakers directly into the enclosure. And as always, you can find links to the GitHub repository and the 3D models down in the description. If you enjoyed this build, feel free to leave any feedback in the comments and consider leaving a like. You can also support the channel through YouTube memberships or Patreon if you'd like to see more open source projects like this. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.